Welcome back to the Growing Up in Scientology YouTube channel. So we're going to try something a little different this time. Um, so I've been meaning to get my interview uh, recorded for quite a while now. So originally the idea was that I was going to do Nick's interview, Nick was going to do my interview, Nick Lister, but uh, Nick, uh, he didn't move to Clearwater, so plans changed, right? So it's been a little while. And um, you know, the original purpose of the channel is to interview people who grew up in Scientology during the era of David Miscavige. And the reason for that focus is because that is the current era, so it's the most relevant thing to discuss right now. But we had an idea that wouldn't it be really interesting to also compare the story of someone who grew up in Scientology during the era of, Dar of David Miscavige to somebody who grew up in Scientology in the era that preceded David Miscavige. Mike, I'm not actually sure how many people know that you did grow up in Scientology as a, as a child, right? Yeah, I did. <laughs> So that's what we're going to do. We have a list of questions that we're going to go down and we're going to just kind of discuss um, our answers to each question. Um, so we're going to kind of interview each other at the same time. Let's see how it goes. So, um, all right, great. So let's see here. The first question is, when did your parents get into Scientology? In around 1961. Okay. Um, I was six years old at the time, and there was virtually, there was very little Scientology in Australia. LRH had just been in Melbourne delivering a congress, mm -hmm. and then they went to Melbourne, and they found out some stuff about it and came back. We lived in Adelaide and came back, and then sometime in the near, like, the a few years subsequently, I guess the Adelaide Org sort of formed. Um, some people had also been in Melbourne and gotten trained or something. I don't even know what the story is about that. But that, I mean, the answer to the question is in about 1961 when I was six. Okay. What about you? Um, <clears throat> similar answer, but different year. <laughs> <laughs> so Shows you how old I am. Probably about 1986. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. 1986. I was six years old. See, look, we have that, <laughs> we have that in common. Um, yeah. So let's see. Let me make sure. It was about 1986. So my mom got into Scientology. Her best friend um, at the time, Cheryl Scredato, got her into Scientology in Philadelphia, and she went into the Philadelphia org. And um, so at that time, there was a nursery. There was actually a nursery <coughs> in the Philadelphia org, and um, the staff and public who n needed their kids taken care of during the day. They would just stay in the nursery. And there was a staff member who was generally assigned to be the nanny. Um, I mean, it could have been worse. <laughs> it wasn't great, but it could have been worse. Um, and so, do you actually remember being six years old and w was there was there a full-blown org? I mean, not do you remember being six, but do you remember being six and going into an org or a mission or something like no. that? No, I, I mean, I remember it like maybe when I was eight or right. nine or something like that. Yeah. And every school holiday period, like the the three school holidays between terms or whatever like you call Christmas them. Christmas or Christmas and spring. I mean it's different. Christmas is right. the long holiday in Australia and then, you know, April and August sometime there September. But in any event, in all three of those holiday breaks I would go to the org and do a communications course, a mm. children's communications course right. with a bunch of other kids. There was like about six or seven other children of Scientologists. I mean, the, the community of Scientologists in Adelaide in the 1960s was like, you know, maybe 20 people. And so those Probably more than there is now, but <coughs> <coughs> it's a maybe 20 people. So at that time, like those 20 people, they all got into Scientology because of attending like a congress that LRH did, or if they came from St. Hill in England, or like they well, came from the U.S.? St. Hill really wasn't, yeah. St. I mean, Hill wasn't really St. Hill then, right? No, although the, the people that really started the Adelaide Org, a guy called Wal Wilkinson and his brother Jim, Wall had been at, at uh, St. Hill studying the briefing course, mm -hmm. and he came back from the briefing course. Now, I don't really remember what year that was, but what happened was then there was this little tiny org and a few people, and remember at that time in Australia, at least in Victoria and Western Australia, Scientology was banned. Right, okay. So. There was like it w there was like a lot more to this uh, 
growing up that way that right, right, you know right. it was like oh the Walt Wilkinson the police came and took away his e-meter and his books you know they raided his house and we used to keep our Scientology books hidden somewhere you know like under the under the, <laughs> right. in the back you know so that nobody would see them it was like really not a, a very popular activity at yeah, the yeah. time so okay so your parents get into Scientology when you were about um, six you said the earliest memory you have is somewhere around eight so what's the first you mentioned like during your school breaks you'd be doing these communication courses what's the first memory that you have of being in an org or it was an org by the first time you were in mm -hmm. it not a mission um, and doing a service it was a communication course that's the first memory you have of doing it absolutely and so you're doing the drills like the the basic zero through four TRs of just and I mean, the vast majority of time spent on TR zero bullway. bullway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so funny because that's the same with me. Except, okay, so in the Philadelphia or you had the nursery, and the kids would just uh, run around wreaking havoc, right? And so the main course room was up on the second floor, and you know whenever we would look into the main course room, there was nothing terribly, terribly interesting other than the clay table. <laughs> so the clay table was everyone's doing their clay demonstrations, which is something that uh, is used in Scientology study. Um, and so you always wanted to be in the course room to mess around with the clay because there was m mountains of, of clay. And so at this time, there was only one course room. So the introductory courses and the major courses were all done in the same course room. So it, the popular thing for the kids to do is to do the communications course, right? And, um, and there was also a course called the Eight Dynamics. It was, I remember it being a big green book, although the course, you're only studying a part of it. But I remember there were very like, very vivid images of people being s sacrificed and stuff. Like, I don't know, it had to do with the God dynamic and the history of how people had interacted green with the book. God. It was a big green book. It wasn't... Sure it wasn't the original What is Scientology? Oh, it totally could have been. In fact, it probably was, and we were probably studying a part of it. So I'm mentioning this because the two courses I distinctly remember doing is the Success Through Communication course, which is the, the communication course, um, and, it's, and the course called The Eight Dynamics. And, um, and of course, I remember bull bait. Bull bait is where you're sitting in front of each other and you're trying to make each other laugh, which as kids is just just a joke, right? <laughs> I just remember we're sitting in front of each other making monkey faces and stuff. And then, of course, I'm doing it with my twin brother. So we start fighting. And, you know, I remember we got sent to ethics for fighting. It's like whatever. <laughs> so that's my first memory of, of doing a Scientology service. And at that point, it wasn't like... We weren't like being, it wasn't like, oh God, we're being forced to do a course. It was almost like you wanted to do it. It was like you were yeah, being yeah, let to do it, right? It was the same with me. They were right. my friends. Right, exactly. And it was like, it wasn't a serious activity. It was right. goof off time. Yeah. It was like time to spend with your friends, not in the house, not with mom watching over you, right. seeing what you were doing all the time. Right, right. You know, you could go mess around and, and do stuff that you weren't supposed to be doing. And, yeah. and there wasn't really, it, the supervisor was there trying to keep control of the kids, but you know, a course break, you were gone. Yeah, out exactly. And running around in the, and it was in downtown <laughs> at the time. So. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so, okay, you mentioned something about the school breaks and being on <coughs> course during the school breaks. That's like three times a year. So that means a normal, it wasn't normal, uh, outside of those, those breaks in the year, it wasn't normal for you to, just on a weekly or daily basis, be in the org doing stuff? No. No? Not and that all. meant your folks, your folks weren't in the org doing stuff? I mean, they may have been, I don't really remember that, but by 1967, we went to St. Hill the first time. Right, okay. So, that you know, and that was when they went and did, uh, actually it was 19... It wasn't 1967, it was 1969. Okay. They went and did the, oh no, the first time was 1967, then again in 1969, and then again in 1973. Got it. So between, just give me an idea, between um, uh, what was the year that you said they got in? You were six years old? 61. Okay, between 61 and 67. That was a you long guys, time ago. Or ancient history. <laughs> between 61 and 67 when you guys went to St. Hill, you guys all went together? Yeah. Okay. So how much Scientology did you as a kid, I mean, you're still pretty young at that age, how much did you really do between that first communications course and when you guys all went off to St. Hill? Was it much? No. Basically nothing else. Just that was what he did. Right. That, I mean, that was the, and, you know, uh, spent 
my parents were very, very close with Wall and Jim Wilkinson, mm. the ED or the, the people that opened the org. So we would spend a lot of time at their house and they'd talk about Scientology. You know, they th that was what the discussions revolved around and and the books that that had been read and whatever happened at the briefing course when Wall was on the briefing course and right. you know. So sort of by osmosis a lot of things came into my universe of how I thought about things or what my ideas were right. about how you kind of approach life. I mean, okay. it, all the way down to like even the ARC triangle. Though, I don't recall that that was, it may have been on the communication course, maybe not, but right. it was certainly one of those things that was something that I learned very early on. Mm -hmm. Like as a kind of a stable thing to right. think within life. A way to think about people and life and whatnot. Right. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. The question we're talking about here, earliest, earliest memory you have of being in an org or a mission. So actually for me, um, my mom joined staff pretty much quite early on. After, after she went into the org, she pretty much almost immediately joined staff. And so we were school age. It was right between five or six <coughs> years old. And yeah, we would spend, I remember we would go to school and then um, I don't remember exactly how we got transported or anything, but we would go from school to the org and then we'd be in the nursery and sometimes we'd be the only ones or sometimes there'd be three or four or five other kids. And, you know, we'd be there until 10 o'clock at night, which is when the org pretty much closed down. Um, and then we'd just drive them. So it was pretty much a daily thing for us. I remember that very distinctly. And um, it was, uh, it, it wasn't, it, it didn't seem weird to us. It was pretty normal. Um, it, uh, even at that early stage, though, there was a little bit of recognizing that what my mom was doing and what was going on in the org and then what happened outside in the real, regular world was different. I definitely mm -hmm. experienced that idea of you didn't really want to talk about, well, okay, from the, from the viewpoint of a child, oh, what does your mom do? I, <laughs> I dreaded that question. Like, <laughs> how do you answer that question without sounding like a weird kid? Right. Like, and what I mean is, you don't. Want, I don't. I want to say my mom works at a church because we didn't think of Scientology as a church. Right. So you want to say my mom works at the org? Oh, the org? <laughs> what, like the cyborg? <laughs> and then you just now you just don't want to be having this conversation. So right. I remember being in at this point it was third grade because my mom was on staff for a bunch of years, and we're all sitting on the floor in like a circle for some reason going around talking about what our parents did. <laughs> remember one of these moments as a child being like really fucking nervous like god i hope this i hope this segment ends before they get to me <laughs> you know like what am i gonna say oh god and um but it would but it was so I, it was that weird dynamic of knowing that whatever was going on and what we were doing was different and hard to explain but also not feeling like it was weird while we were there yeah like, I, hear, you know I, what I, mean? I hear you right, i mean right, right. I, it actually reminds me that you know, the times that we would then go into the local org, and th this goes beyond like 1967, you know, even subsequent years, there was, it was like a, sort of like a community of people that had a common interest and there wasn't, there was no IES reg, there wasn't even a reg at all. Right. It was people, they'd come in there and they'd sit down and they'd have a cup of tea. Right. <laughs> and be chatting and sort of hanging out like with friends and like-minded people and talking about, you know, how were they going to go clear? Not, there w it wasn't uh, an us and them. It wasn't the org and the public. It was the community of Scientologists. Right. And as a, a small community and, you know, kind of a persecuted community, there was this kind of um, camaraderie about it that was, that was kind of cool. It, w it, was, it was a pleasant environment and a pleasant place right, to go right. into yeah. and be around. Yeah. yeah, I had the same thing. When I was at school, I mean, I didn't tell anybody anything about Scientology at all right. and 
you know, my, my parents were never on staff, so I didn't have that, <laughs> well, where are they, what do they do? But it was all very much, uh, you know, we had certain friends that were Scientologists, and those people were treated one way, and then we had other friends who were not, including our family, you know, my cousins and my mother's sister and my father's sister and all those people where the subject never came up. Right. At all. Right, 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 right. Even when we, even when we were going to St. Hill, it was just like, oh, we're going on a vacation or we're going, you know. Isn't that funny? Because you'd never have that, I don't think, you'd encounter that same situation with someone who was Christian or Jewish or <laughs> of course whatever. Not. You, you never be like, Let's don't tell anyone we're going to church. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but maybe that's because people understand going to church. Right. Right. <laughs> I think so. Um, <clears throat> okay, good. So let's see here. Next question is, what's the first time that you were exposed to auditing or doing a course? Okay, now we, we covered uh, the first time of um, being on course. L let's talk about auditing because that's, that's <coughs> kind of a, a, an extra step growing up in Scientology, actually getting auditing, right? Right. Um, so was your first time, you didn't get any auditing until your family went to St. Hill? Until we uh, came back. Oh, is that right? I didn't get any auditing there. How long were you guys at St. Hill when you went there? That first time, uh, like, I think about four months. Maybe it was six. Okay. And my parents went there and they did uh, through power processing. Mm-hmm that had just become available. I, I mean, not just become, but was a relatively It was the thing to new. do. Well, actually, by then, uh, 1967, I think that you could do the clearing course and maybe OT1 or something even at St. Hill, but I'm not sure if you had to be on the briefing course to do it then. I don't remember. But power was like the thing. So they went and did power and power plus. Okay. And I really... I went to St. Hill just kind of... How old were you at this point when you went to St. Hill? Uh, Twelve. Okay. So, but I didn't really have any interaction or involvement with anybody there. I just went there sort of... Not even with it. other kids? What, other kids there hanging out? Same no, situation we as lived, you? We, no, we lived in uh, a town near East Grinstead called Haywards Heath. And I went to school there and... That was... Oh, you're actually going to school. It was almost like you moved there for four months. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So let's just quickly define a handful of terms here. So St. Hill is um, a big castle, a big house, a big manor that L. Ron Hubbard bought in East Grinstead, Sussex in England. It became his, it was his home and it became basically the central hub, the, the main church of Scientology in the world, the central hub of Scientology activity at that time, right? Um, the St. Hill Special Briefing Course was um, a course that was basically where you'd go to St. Hill and LRH would personally deliver lectures every day and... Uh, train people on the most recent auditing processes and people would audit each other and once you finished your little stint at St. Hill you were kind of considered one of the more highly trained auditors in the world at that time and you could go back to where you came from and you were mm -hmm. considered like that kind of the head honcho opinion leader the, the guy who was sort of spearheading Scientology in your city whenever you went back the people who did the briefing course usually went back and were the ones who either opened up or ran their local org true correct um, <clears throat> anything else there that we needed to define? Um, oh, power processing. So now I'm going to tell me if the definition back then is different than the current definition. So currently, if you're go getting Dianetics auditing, new era Dianetics auditing, which is old Dianetics but with an e-meter and slightly different, um, if you finish all of your Dianetics auditing and you haven't gone clear, then you do power processing and power plus, and I don't really know what the actual fucking purpose of it is, other than it's what you do after. After you finish Ned and you haven't gone clear, what was it back then? <laughs> was it that same thing? No, because back then Dianetics was the beginning of the grade chart. New Era Dianetics, even? Not, it didn't even exist. Oh, okay. This okay. was before the Hubbard Standard Dianetics course. Okay, geez. So it was, was just Dianetics. Like Dianetics, Dianetics, Book One, Dianetic Auditing R3R, and then you did grades and once you'd finished your grade up through grade four you uh. did grade five and 5a which was power and power plus so at that point everyone on their way up the d up the bridge did power and power plus processing before mm -hmm. they started their ot levels before they started well 
they before they went clear. Oh, before they oh, then they did the clearing course. Then they did R six E W, and then the clearing course. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Don't, Don't do, do that. that. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, it so, is what it is. So they went to St. Hill to do. Uh, was it largely because you wanted to go to St. Hill because it was kind of the cool thing to do, or were they specifically there to do services that you could only do at St. Hill? Uh, both. Both of those things. Okay, yeah. Great. The first time we went. Okay. Good. So then you come back from St. Hill, and that's the first time you get any auditing. Mm -hmm. And so what was it? What'd you do? What 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 was the auditing? Grades. Grades. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I probably had life repair on whatever, but some uh, woman I can't even remember her name would come to our house and audit me. Oh, so not in the org. Nope. Okay. And so your parents just wanted you to get this auditing. Yeah, I guess. I think it was a friend of my mother's. She may have been doing an internship. I didn't even, I didn't have a clue. Mm. And part of this was that still in Australia at that time, being audited or conducting the practice of auditing was still a no-no. I mean, I don't know exactly how legal or illegal it was, mm. but generally people used to do it not by going to the local org uh, and there's a whole HGC, right. they, they would just be around in their various spots I doing their it. auditing. I get it, I get it. So she did um, some some grades. I, I didn't even know what version, you know, like single, probably single flow grades. Okay, good. So generally speaking, the grades are all audited. They're, they're the same type. They're all audited the same way. It's all the same types of processes. It's generally speaking asking you open-ended questions about yourself or and you just think of the answer and give it to the auditor it's not it's it's as close to I don't know my idea of of what a therapy session might be like I don't know yeah if you, you know if a basic you a process would be can you recall a time you felt affinity for someone yes and then you t say what it was and great thank you can you recall a time you communicated with someone. I mean, these would be like basic, basic types, grades, process, auditing questions. Right. right? A, a fairly simple and innocuous and... and um, sort of by subjects. By subjects, They're exactly. broken down in a series of steps of different subjects, commu handling communication, right. handling problems, you know. <clears throat> so do you remember if at that time was doing the grades something you personally wanted to do or was it like your parents wanted you to do and you hadn't you were sort of neutral on it like do you remember was it something like you you know what i mean yeah i i do actually it was my mother who was the sort of initiation of it and she kind of said look you know maybe you'd like to try this maybe you will find something there that's good maybe it'll be uh helpful or enjoyable to you or whatever and i was like hmm, okay i'll see you know i was not very um i wasn't very committed to it okay. i was kind of i wasn't re i wasn't resisting it i mean if i had resisted it it wouldn't have happened right yeah okay yeah, yeah, but i was not like i wasn't doing it because i went oh I want auditing. Right, right, right. <laughs> it was kind of like it just kind of happened. And do you remember how it went? Yeah, it went fine. It wasn't. It, it wasn't particularly remarkable one way or the other. Right. Like subsequently, many years later, I had um, I redid all those grades, and I guess they were, you know, whatever version at the time it was. They were quickie as hell they didn't last you know I, I think I might have spent two hours doing the right. whole thing right right right, right. but I, I redid them subsequently and I, I uh, probably of all the auditing that I ever had those were the things that I found had the greatest lasting benefit in the real world right not just in your conception of what's happening or your theoretical ideas of oh my god you know I just realized this or I just realized that more um, graspable tangible tangible things that I suddenly went you know what I don't I, I really can't I, f I can feel happy about communicating about this right. or I really don't have to have a problem about that and it actually changed. Yeah. 
You know, it just seems to me that the difference, one, one of the big differences for me between the grades and what's audited on the grades and whatnot, and, and the other parts of the bridge that I think the public tend to hear more about, which is like the Xenu and the OT levels and stuff like that, is that the grades just deal with subjects that are just kind of common sense, um, would apply to absolutely anybody's life kind of thing, regardless of whether you believe anything L. Ron Hubbard ever said about anything at all, right? Like you have grades talking yeah. about memory, and then the next one is communication, and then the next one is problems, and then the next thing is basically destruct destructive acts, and then the subject of change, and then the subject of fixed conditions. So I, I think that's one of the differences between whether that body of knowledge has the ability to make someone actually feel better in any way. Because you're addressing subjects that everyone struggles with to a degree. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, okay, so your first auditing was grades. That's very interesting. So my first auditing, I guess if you can call it auditing, I'm, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, is method one word clearing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So, and I was, so the first auditing you had 12 or 13 years old basically, right? Yeah. So I was about 12 years old when um, this is, I'd already joined staff and I was having to do it. You joined staff when you were 12? Yeah, joined staff when I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> now again, that gets, I'm, I'm jumping the story <coughs> a little bit, right? I because understand. my mom had been on staff for uh, a handful of years and then she left staff and then um, and then she got remarried and it, so in the household it was my mom and her husband and then me and my twin brother and my stepbrother and my stepsister and she had started to homeschool all of us for um, a year oh in addition to two uh, two sons of her other friend so there was I'm, I'm mixing datums here. In the household, it was my mom, her husband, me and my brother, and my stepbrother and my stepsister. On a day-to-day -day basis, there were two extra kids in the household because all six of us were being homeschooled. <laughs> so then, and, and then my, my mom's friend, whose other two children were being homeschooled with us, uh, she had also gotten into Scientology. So after the 1993 IRS event, my mom got all reinvigorated about wanting to be on staff again. And, and the, the idea was, wouldn't it be great? Like, how could... She joined staff again, and I guess her and her friend, Bonnie DiMartino, said, why don't we have all the kids join staff? <laughs> That's what we did. Oh, my God. <laughs> all six of us. <laughs> all six of us joined staff. Now, the timing <laughs> of it was, was perfect because this is when, after the 1993 event, all of the orgs were told, okay, we're in this new era of expansion. Every org is, is putting 20 people into full-time training to be auditors. Well, most people didn't have like 20 staff members. <laughs> most always didn't have 20 staff members. And so the reason this was like a win-win for everybody is we were just gonna go right on to full-time study. We didn't have to get, we didn't have to spend, normally to go on full-time study, you have to spend like three to six months or whatever actually doing a post, uh, you know, proving that you can work in an org. And we were able to skip that step as a lot of kids did in this period. A lot of kids went right on to staff skipped this step, went right into full-time training. So I was doing this small runway of courses to be eligible to go to FLAG for full-time training. And one of the courses was the Method 1 co-audit course. So Method 1 word clearing is basically you have a list of subjects. I don't know, I'm gonna just say 50 or 75 subjects. And you're holding the cans and someone is, uh, calls out these subjects on the e-meter. And, um, and long story short, uh, you basically end up having to just look up the definitions of a lot of words that have to do with these subjects. Now, here's why this was important for me as a first auditing action. This is where I got indoctrinated as to what it took to complete an auditing action. And, and, and the significance of that is a little more than, than what that sounds. So there's this idea that you have to know how auditing works or how an e-meter works. To, to a large degree, you have to know what's expected of you in, sort of, in order to provide what's expected of you, right? Now, and I'm talking about like what it means to finish a process. If you're, a tra if you're trained and experienced in getting auditing, you know exactly what the auditor is waiting to hear. Right. And that's what it means to be a trained pre-clear. You know how to play the game. Now that doesn't mean no one's had real benefits or wins from auditing, but the fact is, if you're trained what the auditor's looking for, you know what to give him. You're playing <laughs> the game. Now, this was specifically applicable to word clearing and method one word clearing, because a lot of what's considered the end phenomena of the process of method one word clearing is not intuitive. It's not obvious. So 
what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to, let's say the subject um, navigation or boating reads on the e-meter. The, then the next question is, is there any word in the subject of boating or navigation that you ha didn't fully understand? Well, I'm a 12-year-old kid who's never studied any of these damn subjects. Right? <laughs> so at first I'm like, yeah, no, uh-uh. <laughs> That's not the right answer to get through the word clearing. <laughs> So eventually I had to be like, oh, now I've got to think of a fucking word in boating or navigation I've never fully understood. So then we would clear up the, clear up the definitions of the words, and now the needle on the e-meter is supposed to make a little motion that's called a floating needle. Well, I didn't know that. So I'd be like, okay, I'm done. Instead of as a trained pre-clear, you know that you've got to do certain things to make your needle more likely to do make a floating needle motion. I mean, am I bullshit? I'm like, this is real, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the needle would float. And then you'd be like, so, so did anything happen? Did anything happen? <laughs> <laughs> of course, the auditor's asking me this question, did anything happen? And the supervisor, it's a student that's auditing me. So the supervisor's standing behind him. And I'm like, what do you mean, did anything happen? <laughs> what does that mean, <laughs> did anything happen? I understand the word now. What's next? And, and after a while, I came to learn that you have to actually have a realization. You have, and in Scientology it's called a cognition. You have to have a realization about this subject. You have to recover some hidden knowledge about this damn subject from clearing these words. Except I wouldn't know that because it doesn't happen naturally. You have to, I, I'll speak for myself. I had to know that that's what was required of me right. in order <coughs> to finish the process. And then I would look inwards and come up with a realization or a cognition about this so I could move on to the next fucking step, right? And that's important. It's, it, I didn't realize the importance of it at that time, but looking back on it, it was quite important because I think a lot of what I experienced in Scientology, I hate to make a generality this early on in the interview, fit that format where I was providing what, what I knew was expected of me and looking inward to find it and maybe I convinced, I had to, you know, convinced, it's not like I was conning everyone around me. I think to a degree I got to a point where I was, I was conning myself. I was looking for the thing inside me that I knew I was supposed to find in order to move on, you know? Okay, so that's a very long answer to the question of what was your first experience with auditing. That was my first <coughs> experience with auditing. I did have much more beneficial, much more pleasant experiences with, with auditing later on. But that first one was, was really rough. It was also the one where I became aware that it was a matter of how to get to the finish line and what did you have to do to get to the finish line. It, um, that, that experience was one that was being done for the sake of finishing it. It wasn't being done for the sake of improvement. It was like, what do I have to do to get to flag? I have to do this. Well, what do I have to do to finish this? Well, you've got to have a win in the subject of boating. Holy shit, I just had a win in the subject of boating. <laughs> I mean, you get what I'm saying, right? I do. I, I mean, that that is a microcosm of a lot of Scientology. Right. Uh, I mean, there are. I mean, everybody's got stories about how they managed to navigate their way through whatever it is that they needed to navigate their way through in order to get wherever it was that they were trying to get. Right. Even down to. What do you need to do to make sure that your needle is floating? Right. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of stories and mm -hmm. techniques that they developed. Now, in truth, a Scientologists or a, a true believing Scientologist will tell you that's not possible. Yeah, they'll say that. But they all do it. They don't believe it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But th this is sort of a part of a, a lot of what the... They'll say if you're doing that... If they were being honest with themselves, they would say, yeah, we know you can do that, but not if you're being ethical. Yeah, and then the, but then the other thing they'll say is, oh, well, obviously the auditor's TRs were out, or, or the, the auditor's auditor meter, metering was poor, yeah. or the auditor missed it. Right. Like, if I was the auditor, I wouldn't have missed that. Right. Well, the truth of the matter is, it that is endemic right. in the subject of... Scientology and the auditing and even training that happens. Totally. I mean, totally. It's it's it, it's just an interesting microcosm. It's interesting you brought that up because it started me thinking about stuff. But <laughs> I'll get off on a roll and then we'll never get it. Right. We have many parts to look forward to here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so for your half of this story, your part of this story here, you've come back, uh, you've got some auditing, 
that your parents aren't on staff, your parents aren't in the Sea Org, you're not on staff, you're not in the Sea Org. It sounds like it was a, a mildly entertaining or whatever experience doing the grades. The next question here is, um, when did Scientology change from being something that maybe you were being compelled to do or forced to do as a child to being something that you embraced and wanted to do yourself? Now, in your case, it doesn't sound like you're really being compelled, right? Maybe you can take us on sort of the, a little snapshot of how do you go from Mike Render, who just got some auditing on his grades in Australia, to, I mean, everyone knows you as Mike Render, the head of Office of Special Affairs. Like, what the hell happened between the age of 12 or, <laughs> 12 or 13 years of age to... <laughs> really? Nothing. <laughs> just just happened. So you're 12 or 13. Like, what's the next big step for you? Joining staff, joining the Sea Org? How do you get a little further <clears> advanced <throat> in your Scientology experience? Well, actually, the next big step was going back again with my parents to St. Hill. In 70, 69. In 69. Mm -hmm. And that was when they did, th they did the, the HSDC, which was a prerequisite, the Hubbard Standard Dianetics course, okay. which had just come out and became a prerequisite to solo auditing. So the HSDC, it's a new, new, more standard, more faster, effective version of the auditing Dianetics. Right. So when you said a prerequisite to solo auditing, a prerequisite to doing your OT levels. Correct. Okay. okay. And then they did through what was at the time OT7. Okay, so they did pretty much all the auditing that was available to be done at that time. Correct. As a public. Correct. They're not on staff, they're not in the Sea Org. Nope. Okay, you go back in 69 with them. Yeah, and How was there for a long, this time it was for a year. Okay. And I went to school again, okay. different school this time in Crowborough, which is another town near East Grinstead. Um, I didn't have a lot of interaction again with anybody really at St. Hill. Um, so like recruiting you into this, it wasn't like, oh God, we got a fresh young Scientologist, let's recruit him right now. Not nope. like that at all. Not like that, not at all. Hmm. I mean, I came to know some of the people there because my parents were there. Like, there was a very famous woman there called Isla Pride, mm -hmm. who was the advanced courses supervisor forever. I mean, she passed away like last year or something. Wow. And had been there forever. And a guy called Chris Burton, who was still around, who was the, the supervisor, mm -hmm. the solo, you know, the advanced courses supervisor. And I kind of came to know them because I was a kid with my parents and uh, you know and many years later I would see them when I went to St. Hill for the I annual IAS event and okay. but I think that what really happened was I became more and more indoctrinated by uh, by example. I consider that my parents were very, very sane, that they were very successful in doing whatever they wanted to do. My dad was a, I mean, he was just an entrepreneur. He did anything. He, he went from managing companies to owning farms to having a travel agency to, I, I mean, just, I, restaurants, e anything and everything. Yeah. And he always had managed to make a, a good life. We had a, you know, I lived a, an upper middle class life. I went to private schools. I, you know, and I considered them to be um, friends uh, as well as parents, like people that I enjoyed. Our family was very close. We spent a lot of time together. We went on trips together. We, you know, it was like there wasn't ever even an idea of trying to escape my family or, you know, now that I'm a teenager, I can get away. It just never, that never even entered my mind. And I, I guess by, sort of by their example, I became more and more convinced that Scientology was a good thing. And a, and a good thing for people. And by the time I was like 17 in my last year of school and I'm thinking about, well, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna go to university? Or what, am I gonna become a doctor? Or what, I mean, what am I gonna do? I basically had decided that I thought it was pretty inevitable that I would join the Sea Org. So when, when your parents went to St. Hill in 69 and you're there for that year, does the Sea Org already exist? 
Yeah, the Sea Org existed. I mean, because yeah, that was Saint Hill was, right? sea, was Sea Org by then. Okay, so it was a Sea Org org. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're exposed to the Sea Org during that whole time. Yep. And these people that you're meeting that are friends with your parents, they're all Sea Org members. Yep. Okay. Yep. The, the in fact the the woman who ran AOSH UK at that time, Darlene Reginus, was a pretty pretty famous Sea Org person, and mm -hmm. she. She was a South African. She sort of marched around in a in a hat and you know, <laughs> looking very officious. And her husband Len was the, I think he was the OT three course supervisor or CS or something. And they like, the Sea Org had a presence then, right, and okay. and it was it was well thought of. It was People. very well thought of, and the and of course particularly at Saint Hill because Saint Hill was the 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 genus of the Sea Org. Everybody that originally went into the Sea Org basically came right. from St. Hill. Because they were on the ship with, um, they were on the ship with LRH. No, no, that was afterwards. No, LRH went off, he left St. Hill and went off and ended up in Tangier. He created the Sea Org. Then there. he created a sea, the Sea Org by buying a boat and telling some people from St. Hill, go get the boat in Hull right. and sail it to Las Palmas. Okay. And that was the start of the Sea Org. And then and at some point like the Sea Org comes and takes over St. Hill, right? Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah, I mean, we didn't even we go get into all the history that. of the Sea but Org. But that's why you're saying everyone who, basically, all the Sea Org members, pretty much, there was they were on the boat, but then they all were from St. Hill and expanded from there. Correct. Right. And then, you know, that then that, that advanced organization was established by the Sea Org. Got it, got it, got it. And that was what the Sea Org was. It oh, was the right. advanced organization. So let me define a term real quick. So about two minutes ago, you said AOSH UK. Right. So AO is advanced org. SH means St. Hill, and UK just means United Kingdom. So before the Sea Org came back to St. Hill, it was just St. Hill. Correct. When the Sea Org came back, they brought with them the OT levels. Correct. So it was now the advanced org and St. Hill UK, AOSH UK. Correct. Okay, so I got off on that little digression by just a clarifying whether your time in St. Hill was spent around Sea Org members. Yeah. So you came, you thought highly of them, set a great example for you at that time, or what? Yeah. Ever they, met a Sea Org member you didn't like up to that point? No. <laughs> no. That, I people, mean, weren't, they, people weren't avoiding they were, the Sea Org they recruiter. They were competent, like they <laughs> and they were smart, and right, they right. seemed to know what they were doing, and they had a real purpose in life and they were you know dedicated to helping people and it's funny uh, you know I've been criticized by some for saying that generally you know Scientologists the run-of-the-mill Scientologists that you see around are good people they are yeah their their idea of what they are doing may be misguided but the reason for doing it is very good yeah, yeah and, I agree. and totally. those people that were there did create an impression on me. Right. They created the impression that these were people that were really doing something to change the world for the better. Right. And that was, that appealed to me. And um, so I sort of, you know, was kind of resigned to the fact that I was going to be joining the Sea Org. Right. And that what I wanted to do when I joined the Sea Org was not join the Sea Org and be in Sydney, which is where by the time I did the Sea Organization was in Australia, but was to go to where L. Ron Hubbard was. And at that point, was it on the Apollo, mm -hmm. flagship Apollo? On the Apollo in the Mediterranean. So then when you said uh, a, a short while back um, that you're basically at the point where you're graduating high school and you have to decide which way you're gonna go. Did you graduate high school? Yeah. And was that in England or in Australia? In Australia. Okay. So you graduate high school in Australia at 17, 18? What are you? Yeah, no, I was 17 and I was, I graduated high school in December of 1972. I turned 18 in April of 1973. Hmm. And that was when I joined the Sea Org. Ah, so you joined the Sea Org. Um, uh, I just, I can't resist asking for the, the nitty gritty details. Do you sign up in Sydney and then you get sent off to the Apollo or do you fly to England and sign up there or you go to the ship? What do you do? Okay. I signed up, there was, that was back in the heyday of the Tours Org, and the Tours Org was a part of the Sea Org that was sent, where people were sent around on tours to promote... Whatever. I'm, whatever. <laughs> okay. 
and there was a, a guy who or two guys that came to Adelaide and when they came to Adelaide to do their tours they used to stay with us mm. and one of them was named John Parcell and the other one was named Steve Stevens and John Parcell was a long long-term Sea Org member he was a class 8 that had done the class 8 auditor training course aboard on board the Apollo with L. Ron Hubbard and uh, Steve Stevens was this guy who was a like a, a, a virtually a professional rugby player from New Zealand whose family had founded Scientology basically in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. His mother was Phil Stevens who became a very very high-ranking person in the Sea Organization and worked directly with L. Ron Hubbard. Um, they came and right when I was turning 18 and there was like okay Time, let's go. But they're the tour Zorg. Does that mean they're on tour from the flagship Apollo? No, from Sydney. From the from the Oh from the Apollo Sydney. Or Sydney. Okay. No, that, there was around these terms, Mike. I know. But okay, it was the, the, the Continental the Management Organization in Sydney. Yeah, it was the liaison office for the flagship. <laughs> so you got signed up in Sydney. How do you Yeah, okay. But I when I got signed up I said, I'm only signing up with you guys if I can go to the Apollo. And they said, oh, great, there is a program right now where we are having to send people for training on what's called the Flag Executive Briefing Course. Okay. So, we will send you. Mm. And you're 18. And I'm 18. And you just joined the staff for the first time, and you go to the ship to do the Flag Executive Briefing So, I go, first of all, I go to Sydney, and I hang out there for a while, and then... What happens is, actually, my parents decide that they're going to go back because, as is very typical in Scientology, great plans often fall apart because there's no money. Even though Scientology has got so much money it doesn't know what to do with it, if you want to buy toilet paper, there's no money. If you need to fly to somewhere, there's no money. But, I mean, that's a whole nother subject. Of course, now there's no money for me to fly to flag. So technically, Sydney at this point is saying, you're going to go to the ship, you're going to do this course, but you're our staff member, you're coming back when you're done. Correct. But they don't have the airfare to send you to the ship. Correct. <laughs> okay. So then what so happens? <laughs> my father decides that he and the rest of the family are going to go back to St. Hill for something. I don't even know what it was at that point. Something. He says... Oh, well, you're supposed to be going there. Why don't you come with us? So. And are you a Sea Org member? I'm a Sea Org member. Okay. <laughs> so I went with them. <laughs> on a, uh, uh, we sailed on like a, a ship from Perth you to Singapore <laughs> and hung out in Singapore for a while and then flew to London and then I joined this, you know, joined up with the Sea Org when we got to England. So now. technically, were you transferred? Were you now like a St. No, staff member? No, I was there because that was the relay point to go to the Apollo, which at the time was in Portugal. I got it. I that got was it. the closest place. But then when I got to, to the United Kingdom, I was told, well, you can't go to the Apollo because you haven't done the Estates Project Force. Okay, right. So That's like Sea Org Boot Camp. Yeah. Okay. So I did that. And then I went to the Apollo. And then when I walked on board the Apollo, I said, okay, I'm here for the flag executive briefing course <laughs> and uh, the person who was in charge of personnel on the Apollo which happened to be Maria Starkey okay. Norman Starkey's wife said oh no 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 change of plans they they traded you you're, you're ours now you're ours now <laughs> that's so common <laughs> and you're gonna be a deckhand <clears throat> nice and I was like were you yeah were you wanting to stay on the Apollo oh you weren't no. Oh, so er, when you said, I, uh, I'm i going to sign up with you, but only if I can go where LRH is, not like to go work there forever, just to go sort of, you know, put a toe in the water or something like yeah, that. Yeah, see what it was like. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so now you're 18 years old, you're on the flagship Apollo, now you're flagship staff, and you're scrubbing decks. Awesome. That's it. Chapter one of <laughs> Michael J. Rinder, the Sea Org member. Exactly. Okay, so good. what about you? All right, let's get into my answer. It's not going to be anywhere as cool as that. All right, uh, how are we doing on time? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. So we'll just keep going. <laughs> you can answer this bit and then we'll be done. Okay, good. 
Um, so let's see, what was the question? When did Scientology come, uh, change from being something that maybe you were being compelled to do or forced to do as a child to being something that you embraced and wanted to do yourself? Okay, so <clears throat> it was around the same time where, where my mom joined staff and we were all joining staff as well. And um, we were basically going to training to be full-time auditors. Right. Uh, we didn't know what the hell that meant, right? So I, I distinctly... <laughs> I distinctly remember the conversations that we would have with our mom where she was kind of explaining what it meant. And I, I, rem I really remember the parts of these conversations where I'm sort of like psyching myself up and you know, dis trying to distill the explanations down to its most simple ideas and being like, trying to convince myself that that would be fun. That would be something I could get into. Like, you know, I had this idea that auditing was this big complicated thing and it's like, okay, so it's really just asking questions Okay, so asking questions and getting people to answer it, but the e-meters, e-meters involved, and you know, but tr just trying to put the pieces together as a twelve-year-old of why, why I was doing this. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like I had anything else better to be doing. Right. I as a twelve-year-old, you got nothing else better to do, but I still wanted to um, get excited about it. And I, I remember getting to a point where I was at least getting excited about it. And even if it wasn't getting excited about being an auditor, I was sucking myself up to get excited to go to move to Flag, to move to Florida and be studying full time at Flag. And my God, I remember the day we got word that we'd finally been approved to go to Flag, right? So it means I'd finished the basic courses of a staff member. So there's staff status one, there's staff status two, there's the student hat, there's method one co-audit and some other courses. And then you put a big request together and you send it to flag to the, so they say, yes, you can come. We were on the corner playing street hockey outside of our house in a church across the street with all the friends that I'd basically grown up with. And I've thought about this a few times since then. And somehow we got word that the approval just came in, which essentially meant we were now going to go home and pack and get ready to get on a freaking plane the next day or whatever. And I was, at this point, I, whatever, however I'd psyched myself up about this opportunity, I was so elated. I was like, sorry, guys. You know, we're in the middle of a street hockey game, right? <laughs> I was like, all right, man. Sorry, guys. Got to go. I mean... Looking back on it, it seems a little weird. These were friends I'm, I'm actually almost never going to see again. And I didn't give a fuck. I, and that's, I'm not like, saying it like it's some terrible thing. It's amazing looking back on it, though, as a 12-year-old, that however I had psyched myself up for this opportunity right. was so more exciting and important than the friends I'd gone to school with, uh, the only friends I knew in my life. And it was like, all right, guys, see you, man. I, it, it wasn't even like, oh, man, I'm never going to see you again. It was like... Oh my God, we got approved. All right, Colin, let's go. Let's go. Get the, get the fucking sticks. Get the balls. We got to get home. <laughs> we went home and, and we all packed. And, um, and that was it. We were, you know, we, we, we were, grew up in Malvern, Pennsylvania. And um, we packed everything up and uh, got on a plane and flew to Florida. And the way we were doing it is me and my brother Colin and one other person, it might have been my stepsister Allie, we got on a plane and went first. We were just boom, we were there. Um, because my mom and, and like four or five other out of org trainees uh, or staff members from Philadelphia who were going, they had to get everything all prepared. Like they were going to get a U-Haul and pack up all the materials that we were going to need while we were studying at FLAG. No, it was me, my brother Colin, and a friend of ours, Edward DiMartino. We went first, and then everyone else came like two weeks later. And it was exciting. I yeah. mean, for us, it was very exciting. We're 12 years old. You know, at this point, we're starting to be told about the bridge. We're starting to be told about OT. We're starting to be told about staff. We're starting to understand the Sea Org. We're starting to understand who David Miscavige is and where he fits into the story. And, and uh, an interesting part of this is also, um, as a kid growing up in the org, um, you know, Scientology has these big events four or five times a year. Well, those, we love those things because while everyone was in the event, we were wreaking havoc and, and playing, you know, either downstairs in the org with all of our friends or sometimes if the event was in a hotel, we'd be, you know, messing around on the escalators and the elevators and just, like, we looked forward to these events, right? What we didn't do was sit down and watch the <laughs> events. The 1993 IRS event was the first event that for some reason I just snuck in and watched it and it happened to be the end of it. 
and I was at this point maybe even 11 and it blew me away like looking back on it I don't even know how I understood what they were talking about in the event right they're talking about IRS you know uh, religious recognition they're talking about the whole story <coughs> you know he tells the whole story I think I watched the last hour of the event and at the end when they when he announced the war is over and everyone's freaking out and everything I was like I was like practically out of my fucking head I mean it was a really big deal for me I'd never almost even felt like that before you, and just watching this event no one told me to go in and watch that event right and so things started to change for me pretty quickly after that you know after that event and um so that's when it started to become something, um, change from something I was doing sort of because I had to. Like, like when our mom first told us we're all joining staff, it was almost like, ugh. You know, when we joined staff and we had to be on course until 10 o'clock at night studying about how to use a dictionary, it was like, oh, fuck, this sucks. But there was a point in there where I started to enjoy the studying itself. And then it started to be, I started to enjoy the excitement of, getting ready to go to flag and then I started to enjoy just being at flag and by the time I was at flag and you know you're studying 100 hours a week right and you're starting to meet people from all over the world and everyone's doing the same thing and you're starting to meet some people some other people started to trickle in that were about our same age at first we were just the youngest people there um, and it started to take on a whole um, a whole unique existence that was just completely 100% separated from anything I'd been doing before that. Yeah. You know, like there was there was who I was at that point from then on, and then who I was before that point, and there were two completely different people. Yep. Um, and, and so that was it. That was the point for me. Um, and uh, we got a lot more to go here, so we got a lot more parts to record. But that's going to be it for now. Hope it's been uh, uh, fun and entertaining for you guys. Um, that's it for now, right? Yep. Okay, good. Thanks for watching, and we'll do part two very soon. Bye.